Hello, everybody. My name is Marco Nunez. I want to thank you for uh, being present for this webinar, for taking the time out of your day to be present here. Um, second, I'd like to thank Strive Tech for hosting uh, this webinar and providing us with the information. Uh, today's webinar is going to consist and we're going to be focusing on EMG sensors and how EMG is in the applied setting for injury mitigation. Please keep in mind this is part one of a four part series. Today we're going to be focusing on the function, more importantly the symmetry, the ratio, the muscular imbalance and how it affects, it affects injury, how you can use EMG sensors, um, EMG technology to be able to identify that and monitor your athletes and, re and reduce the risk of injury. Um, the other part 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 two is going to be focused on fatigue. Part three is going to be focused on performance in EMG sensors. And finally, part four is going to be focusing on how to use EMG sensors during the rehabilitation phase as you progress your athlete through the um, milestones and return to activity. Let's get started. So before we get started, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Marco Nunez. I am a performance athletic trainer. I've been practicing as a performance athletic trainer for a little bit over 20 years. Majority of my experience has been in the professional setting. Like uh, my resume says there, most recently I was the head performance athletic trainer for the Los Angeles Lakers. If you have any questions regarding EMG, regarding strike tech, regarding any uh, functional stuff, you're also welcome to DM me at Marco A. Nunez 17 on my Instagram account. So first, the objectives for this webinar. The first one's going to be we're going to be discussing a, a little bit more understanding of symmetry and balance. I know most of you as athletic trainers, physical therapists, chiropractors, uh, strength and conditioning coach pretty much have a, a good grasp understanding. So we're going to do a quick review on the symmetry and balances. Second, we're going to touch upon the relationship between imbalances and injuries, how they relate it. Um, get a little bit of understanding how that works. We're not going to dive too much into it, uh, but we're going to touch upon it. Second, we're going to talk about EMG technology itself, how it has evolved, how Strive has been able to validate the EMG sensors within their shorts. Um, second, fourth, we're going to talk about the EMG technology and Strive itself. And then finally, we're going to review a couple case studies where EMG technology through Strive Tech technology has been utilized to identify some imbalances, um, how it applies to some of the injury compensation patterns that occurs among athletes, as we all know athletes, professional athletes, collegiate athletes, high school athletes, one of the big things that makes makes them athletes in general or just humans is compensation for them to be able to continue performing the activity no matter whether it's fatigue, no matter whether it's injury, whether it's an opponent or anything of that sort, compensation, compensation is a big uh, proponent or not proponent, a big component of, of an athlete and our job as physical therapists, athletic trainers is to identify those compensation patterns and hopefully reduce the risk of injury. So symmetry, what is symmetry? Symmetry oftentimes refers to the correspondence of the body parts in size, shape, and relative position on opposite sides of a dividing line or distributed around a central point of axis. This image here, we can see as far as the muscular structures themselves, we don't know what the joints themselves, but as far as just looking at the picture, we see a good symmetrical proportion with this athlete or this individual between the right upper body extremities and the left upper body extremities. Now, continuing on symmetry, symmetry deals with the mirror image of how your body looks if, if it's folded over or folded in half. This image, obviously, it's not this individual. It was a little bit of cut and paste, a little editing type of thing. But this would be an, an individual would be asymmetrical. Obviously, the left side does not compare to the right side. But also in itself, as practitioners, we understand there that no one is 100% symmetrical, either right-handed, left-handed dominant, right leg dominant, right, left leg dominant. You're going to be a little bit asymmetrical. The question is when someone gets too off as far as the asymmetry type of thing. Second, obviously, the definition here is just the mirror image. As practitioner, we're not just looking at the mirror image. We're looking at other body parts. More importantly, we're looking at the muscular output or muscular function between the left and the right, and also referring to the cross thing as well. We're also looking at the joints, um, flexibility, mobility, and other portions of it. So it's not just the 100% the mirror image, but obviously, overall, what we're trying to do, we're trying to see uh, symmetry within our athletes, within our patients, within our, our clients that we're working with. 
So one of the things that we're looking when it referring to symmetry, we're looking for muscular balance between the antagonist and the agonist muscle, especially during movement, because that's where majority of the injuries occur. So we're not just always just looking at the right um, biceps muscle compared to the left biceps muscle or the right hamstring to the left hamstring muscles. That is one component that we tend to look at as far as when we do assessments. But when the athlete is, is in a functional movement, uh, we're looking for the um, asymmetry or the balance, I, I would probably say in this case, between the agonist and the antagonist muscle. In this case, one of the biggest areas we tend to look at is between the quadriceps and the hamstring uh, muscular balance. There's been plenty of studies out there that shows when there's an imbalance between the quad and the hamstrings, um, an athlete starts, starts compensating or injuries may occur, whether it's soft tissue injuries, whether it is to the muscle or whether it's more injuries to the ligaments, um, or it may be up to the hip, compensation patterns will, will, will occur. So Canada in 2014 did a study, and this is what they identified as far as the imbalances, where they found significance that the antagonist and agonist muscles surrounding the joint have reciprocal and they should have balanced strength, endurance, and power. If movement is out of balance and inefficient, the result is compensation in the structure. And that is what we're trying to kind of identify as healthcare providers or practitioners, is that we're trying to kind of find when an athlete compensates and try to reduce the amount of compensation the athlete uh, occurs. As like I mentioned, as athletes, that is part of the game. They will learn how to compensate, whether it's due to an injury, whether it's due to fatigue, whether it's to muscle imbalance, whatever it is, they do it. Obviously, when that does occur, then there's a higher risk of injury. Also, when they're working out, we want to make sure we, we reduce the compensation pattern. So this is where we're going to talk a little bit as far as the muscular imbalances. So when we do identify muscular imbalances or muscular imbalances occur, one of the big issues that we arise is injuries. Majority of non-contact injuries or issues tend to occur due to some type of imbalance. Now, some of the issues may be some kind of tendonitis, whether it's patella tendonitis, Achilles tendonitis, hamstring tendonitis, um, anything within the lower extremity or, or the upper extremity, oftentimes these tendonitis issues tend to do be um, caused or a result of uh, some form of imbalance, whether it's lack of mobility imbalance from one side to the other, lack of muscular imbalance between the left and the right, or between the upper or down, we always kind of look at the kin kinetic change. In this case, the body is a compensating machine. Like I mentioned, they're athletes, whether professional level, collegiate level, high school, weekend wars, whatever it is, your body is going to learn how to compensate to be able to perform its task or complete the task and complete the job that is requested of the body, whether it's something simple as a squat, a lunge, a sprint, a jump, complete the game, complete the kick, complete the shot, whatever it is, your body's going to learn how to compensate to be able to do it. Obviously, the higher the compensation issues or the patterns, the higher risk of injury. So as healthcare providers, our goal is to try to kind of identify those compensation patterns to try to reduce them, hence reducing the risk of injury among athletes and among our clients. So why is muscular balance so important? Well, one of the importance of muscular balance is the strength and more importantly the injury prevention. In this case we're going to be referring to or we're going to be talking about synergistic dominance. In this case synergistic dominance is defined as a trait where one muscle becomes so dominant it can inhibit a muscle that helps with the same movement. In this case it can either be along the fascia line or it could be the antagonist muscle. Now the image on the right hand side as we all know, it's referred to a cross link. The cross link can either be in the, in the frontal plane or it can also be in the sagittal plane, where one muscle is either stronger than the other, um, which doesn't allow the, uh, the opposite muscle to, to function properly. It can be lack of, uh, it could be due to weakness, it could be to overstrength, or sometimes it can also be due to just muscular tightness. Uh, in this case, if we look at the image uh, to the left, where we see the gentleman, we're looking at, at the upper body. Oftentimes, we've identified where either we have muscular weakness in the posterior chain, more in the uh, shoulder blade area, and then there tends to be muscular tightness up in the anterior portion, um, where it would be more in the pectoralis muscles, or it can be weakness on the other end. Same thing on the image with the right side, where we're looking at the lower extremity, one of the big proponents when it comes to athletes that have um, hamstring injuries, it can be where the, you have the pelvis on a more anterior pelvic, we'll refer to as the anterior pelvic tilt, where 
the anterior muscles more than hip flexors, the quad muscles tend to be more in a, a muscular tightness, which causes the pelvis to kind of rotate anteriorly, which then places the hamstring muscle at a more tension or stress to try to kind of correct that movement and oftentimes may result in a um, some kind of soft tissue injury, whether most likely as a hamstring strain. But oftentimes it can either be lack of weakness or the muscular tightness. Now, when we're referring to the synergistic dominance and we look at look at, at the local level, um, we're going to kind of take one body part or one joint or, or one or two muscles in this case where the agonist and antagonist kind of meet. In this case, we're referring to more the biceps or the triceps, um, or once the agonist, once the antagonist. But in this case, also we also talk about the quad. Or the or earlier images was referring to the quad and the hamstring um, uh, synergistic dominance or ratio, so to speak. Now, if you look at the image on the left-hand side, when you have normal muscular balance and there's a normal, normal muscular output, if you see the image where both muscles of quad and uh, the hamstring have a corrective balance, so to speak, you see that the level the lever is kind of pretty much even on the part. Now, on the right-hand side, the same image in a little group area, when there is an imbalance in the muscular output or just the muscular strength, so to speak, there you see the lever kind of tilting to one side more on the dominance where the muscles are a little stronger. That's when the compensation patterns occur. That's when the athlete's at higher risk of injury because there's an imbalance between the muscular output. In this case, when we're referring to the quad and the hamstring, there's a certain ratio. There's been plenty of data studies in there that you want to kind of maintain a certain ratio. Anything above 0.8 is sufficient as far as reducing the risk. I believe from what I recall, 0.6 should be the minimum number as far as that every athlete or every client should have between the quad and hamstring ratio. Anything below that, places the athlete at a higher risk of injury. Does it mean they're going to sustain an injury? It does not. It just means it's going to, they're at a higher risk of injury. So one, utilizing um, technology or items to be able to kind of objectively identify these areas is great. And there's something we're going to touch upon a little bit earlier where there is a clinical setting where you do the testing and then there, where there's a functional um, testing where one, you are in a controlled environment where you're in a clinical setting and you're able to have the athlete tested. I know there's device out there you can identify where the quad and hamstring, but what about when they're out there running on the field? What have you, what are you currently using to be able to identify when there's in the functional stage, when there's a change of direction, the change of pattern, that acceleration, deceleration movement, that the muscle has to be able to kind of function at full speed and that's in an uncontrolled environment. I've been a big proponent of testing athletes in an uncontrolled environment because as we all know, majority of injuries do occur in an uncontrolled environment, not in a controlled environment. They don't occur while you're working them with rehabbing with them or working them out in the clinic where everything's controlled. So you want to be able to have the opportunity to test them in an, in, in, in an uncontrolled environment and see what muscular imbalances do occur while they're out there performing or competing in this case. Now, if we're looking at the global aspect of the synergistic dominance and how the body kind of uh, adapts itself. So globally, is the manner in which the muscular skeletal system organizes itself from top to bottom. And that's what we're referring to as far as the kinetic chain. And this is where the from top to bottom, how the body functions. And as practitioners, whenever we're looking at an injury or compensation pattern, as we all know, if an athlete has something as a patella tendonitis in the knee, Oftentimes, that is just a result of something else. So we oftentimes have to look above and below down the kinetic chain, whether it's in the hip or it's, the issue is more in the hip muscular imbalance or maybe a poor hip mobility type of thing going there. Or we're also, we have to also make sure we look down below at the ankle joints, the ankle um, proprioceptors as well, and try to identify it. Um, like I keep mentioning, I'm going to kind of sound a little bit like a broken record here and kind of keep reiter reiterating it, that the body is a compensating machine. It will do what it needs to do to be able to complete its task at hand, whether it's kick a ball, whether it's shoot a basketball, whether it's hit a ball, continue running, continue sprinting, continue um, performing its task that has it's requested to do. As athletes, that's what they do. Obviously, like you mentioned, the more compensation that occurs within the body, the higher risk of injury uh, for an athlete or client. Now here's an example of a muscular imbalance in the lower extremity that's very common um, that I know we talked about between the quad and the hamstring ratio. So one of the most common compensation patterns is in the quad and the hamstring ratio, where the hamstrings and the quads both play a huge role in knee stability. Now, 
even though quads and hamstring do play a key role, we do have an understanding that the that the uh, glute muscles, both the glute meat and the glute max, are also play a huge component. There's been plenty of studies in that part. But here we're going to kind of dive in the local level, uh, not the global level, as far as trying to identify how the quad and the hamstring um, muscular imbalance may affect the ACL. So as we all know, where the quadricep muscle extends the knee, attaches at the tibia, and what it does, does the forward movement of the tibia. And on the other hand, the hamstring does the opposite action, where it also attaches to the tibia, but the hamstring helps sustain or move the tibia in a backwards movement. So if there is an imbalance here between the quad and hamstring, and let's say that there is uh, a lot higher muscular output coming from the quadricep muscles versus the hamstring muscles, the quadricep muscle is going to create more force or more anterior force and move the move the tibia more forward, hence placing additional stress on the ACL. Now, again, would this result in an ACL tear? We don't know. We don't know how much force is being put in on there. But at the same time, the hamstring's job as a secondary motion is to try to help maintain the tibia and stabilize it and take some of the stress off the ACL. Hence, when we do ACL, um, rehab, we're also focusing on the glute and the hamstring to try to kind of balance along with the quad muscle in the front to try to stabilize the kneecap as well. So another issue that may arise from this, this movement would also be patella tendonitis or quad tendonitis. So this is just an example of how a muscular imbalance can result in a major injury such as an ACL. So like I mentioned earlier, some of the most common lower extremity compensation injuries tend to be a tear to the acute cruciate ligament, or also known as ACL, and also hamstring strains. These are some of the big injuries or issues that most athletes in a ground force contact sport, or even non-contact sport, so to speak, uh, may experience due to compensation patterns in the lower extremity. The next two slides, we're going to be discussing the role of hip strength in ACL prevention. There's plenty of research, plenty of studies that identify proper hip strength coming from the glute max, glute med, is important and vital to having proper knee stability and then the help of reducing ACL injuries. Furthermore, there's been plenty of studies that showed that even having proper hip strength helps reduce ankle instability and reduce the injuries to uh, such as ankle sprains. So as far as when it comes to ACL injuries, they're very common across a variety of sports and are often considered a non-contact or occur non-contact in nature most of the time, not all the time. Non-contact ACL injuries typically are associated with sports that involve activities such as cutting, landing, deceleration, in other words, change of direction. The mechanism of injury often involves abnormal movement in both the frontal and transverse planes of motion. This often puts the knee in a position of relative valgus and internal rotation and in turn increases the strain on the ACL. The valgus loading of the ACL occurs rapidly following the ground contact. Plenty of researchers have suggested that the weakness and poor neuromuscular control of the hip musculature contributes to the increasing load. Hence, identifying, monitoring, the neuromuscular output or the muscular output of the glute max during competition is very crucial. Like I keep mentioning, I know we monitor it and we identify any deficiencies or patterns, um, compensation patterns while we're doing assessments in the clinical settings. But like I mentioned, athletes, patients, clients, the human body in general is a compensatory machine. The athlete or the individual will learn how to perform a task, whether it's a single leg squat, whether it's a triple jump, whether it's a triple jump for distance and landing and whatnot. The body will be able to compensate to be able to perform the task. The one thing that the athlete or the individual cannot compensate is that if there is no muscular output coming from the glute, coming from the hamstring, or coming from the quad, they cannot cheat, they cannot create it. And technology like Strive Tech will be able to identify whether the muscular output comes out of there or not. An athlete cannot just produce it out of nowhere. Either it's there or it's not there. 
So again, the relationship between the hip strength and the lower extremity mechanics and movement has been identified for several years. There's been plenty of research, plenty of studies that has identified that proper hip strength coming from the hip, in other words, from the glute max, glute med, helps stabilize the knee along with the ankle and hence reducing any type of soft tissue or injuries that occur to, to athletes or individuals. There was a study of 30 healthy individuals that established a relationship between hip strength and valgus movement. Those with less hip ab abduction strength demonstrated greater knee movement in a valgus direction during the single leg squat than individuals with greater hip strength, hence those that have more, had more um, valgus stress were at a higher risk of injuries, whether such something simple as, or something greater as a ACL injury, or something small um, and kind of chronic issues as patellotendinitis or quad tendinitis. Wilson et al. found that hip external rotation strength was also associated with frontal plane knee motion during a single leg squat in a population of college athletes. Jacobs et al. reported that during a single limb landing maneuver, women who have a higher risk of ACL injuries than male counterparts demonstrated decreased hip abductor toward and increased knee valgus compared with men. Now, again, some of these research studies and some of these tests that we perform as far as assessment in a clinical setting, an athlete can easily compensate and be able to perform the task. But when they're out on the field, when they're in their environment, when they're in their nature, so to speak, when they hit that on switch, they go and they don't really think about their movements. Hence, that's when the compensatory patterns occur. Being able to monitor your athletes while they're out on the field, while they're in competition, while they're in practice, while they're in scrimmage, and be able to identify any compensatory, any fatigue patterns, any indifferences in muscular imbalances and muscular output while they're in action is crucial because that's where the injuries occur. So now we're going to touch upon some of the assessments that are being utilized to um, determine when an athlete or individual or client or patient is ready to return to play um, from an ACL injury, so to speak. Uh, these are some of the prime examples that are often utilized as part of their assessment and also to determine where an athlete is either ready to return to activity um, in a laboratory. And what I mean by laboratory, I mean in a clinical setting, in an athletic training room, in a weight room, or, um, or in a weight room. Uh, the less is one of the most common ones that's been utilized. All these have been validated. The double leg drop test has been utilized. The single leg drop test, and I know the single leg triple jump is one that's very popular. It's been utilized by a lot of physical therapists, athletic trainers, um, when rehabbing um, an individual or determining how the progression or their milestones. Now, all these tests are great. I use them myself. They're, it's a great, all these great, great tests to be utilized to be able to determine if an athlete is ready to return to some kind of activity or return to play. It's utilized as a validation. But again, one of the issues with some of these tests is, again, it's in a, in a controlled environment where athletes do not play in an uncontrolled environment. So how can we test our athletes in an uncontrolled environment when they're out on the field and be able to determine when those compensation patterns occur when they're ready? Um, I'll give you a prime example. There was a study, uh, there was a young lady, a soccer player from, the, I believe, the University of Rutgers, where they were doing her assessment. She was returning from an ACL injury. She performed all these tests. She did great uh, on these tests, and they cleared her to return to play. We utilized the Strive technology to try to kind of determine, see where she was at when she was out on the field and, and running. Um, the Strive technology was able to identify that during practice, she was actually doing pretty good. Her movements, her compensation patterns, her glute strength, her hamstring to quad ratios were really good during practices, during scrimmages, and whatnot. Now, when it came to a game, um, all that kind of went out the window, so to speak, where she quickly resulted in, she started fatiguing her glute right away. She started compensating to those movements. So basically the training staff was able to identify that she wasn't quite ready to return to competition. She was able to return to activity. She was able to return to practice. She was able to return to scrimmage with the team, but she was not necessarily ready to return to competition. So this is where the next step, and there's something we're gonna be discussing for the rest of a couple of slides. Now, there was a study done here between um, athletes or individuals that came off a re ACL reconstruction versus healthy athletes or healthy individuals. That is referring to kind of the traditional assessments which are done, which I mentioned uh, in the slide before. And one of the things that you notice, uh, most of these assessments that were performed there 
were in a linear uh, uh, fashion or, or linear direction. There wasn't much of change direction. I know change direction is a big uh, component. I know a lot of my colleagues, as far as physical therapists, when they're rehabbing, they make sure they introduce this change of direction with athletes as they're ret returning players, as they're rehabbing them. But how do we, how are we assessing them as far as and how are we making sure that the compensation patterns are still not there or, or occurring? Um, so here in this study, they introduced these athletes and they wanted to see how they will, how they did during a sidestep cutting maneuver that was at about a 45 degree angles. So like I mentioned, they took athletes that either came from an acerbic construction surgery and healthy athletes. One of the biggest things that the authors found was that that the athletes that had a history of ACL displayed a lot of increase in knee um, abduction angles and knee abductor moments compared to the healthy players. So there is a lot of literature out there that offers a um, combination of field and laboratory-based change direction tests, um, just like the example with, I gave you right before that was kind of done in a laboratory setting. Um, but one of the biggest issues is that some of the assessments appear to be more sensitive in their ability to identify alterations in movement mechanics following ACL, but they are also lack ecological validity. In other words, you can identify some of the alterations in a controlled environment, but when you take the athlete into in their uncontrolled environment or their true nature, that is where the where we should be doing some of the testing or some of the assessments in a functional stage in their environment, in their movements. Um, during real life movement. Now I get it, if you're in a clinical setting, obviously you cannot have the whole entire team come down and you cannot do a couple of tests because you're working with the athlete one-on-one. -on -one. You may have a colleague kind of work with you type of thing. I know I've done that before, but being able to get them out there is kind of tough. So being able to have some kind of technology or some kind of device to be able to kind of monitor the athlete as they're moving during their game, during their competition, during their scrimmage, during their practice to be able to identify how the, 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 if there's any muscular imbalances, any compensations would be great to have. So what are some of the issues uh, or limitations, so to speak, with the traditional assessments that we're currently doing in a clinical setting? So one of the biggest ones is that they tend not to be proportionate to true sports specific movements. Um, like I mentioned, 70% of the assessments or the testings that we do in a traditional setting or in a clinical setting tend to be lean, in a linear speed. Only 30% have involved a turning phase. So what they identified is that these are tend not to be adequate um, to identify deficits in movements, particularly move between involvement and uninvolved limbs. So the recommendations that they have set forth is that evaluating the entry and exit velocity may be of interest to more clearly elucidate how the direction change is performed further removing the effect of confounding factors such as linear speed. So yes, identifying linear speed, doing assessments in linear speeds are great, and that is part of the um, return to play protocol, uh, return to activity, or as I call it, kind of one of the milestones that the athlete has to go through before they do change direction. So there is a process, so linear speed is part of the process. That's when they go all the clinical settings, but once we get them past the clinical setting, what are we doing to make sure that they are able to transition onto the field and do assessments onto the field as far as it becomes more sport specific for them uh, to try to help reduce the risk of re-injuring either the ACL, re-injuring a opposite limb, or decreasing the compensation patterns as they're returning to play. So here's a, a few list of what we consider non-traditional assessments or what you sh we should be considering as far as non-traditional assessments should be incorporated into the athletes as, their, as the determination um, for them to be clear to return to competition. One, some of the assessments should be done in a competition versus non-competition phase. Obviously, the, most of the assessments are non-competition because they're running in a controlled environment, whether it's even on the field, running forward, doing change of direction drills, cone drills, you name it, that's all non-competition. Ideally, that's not realistic as far as how they compete or how they play. You would want to be able to do something as far as assessing them and um, monitoring them during a competition phase before they get out there. Again, that's also kind of tough to do because unless you bring in the whole entire team or you bring a squadron of, of athletes, uh, whether it's football, basketball, or anything of that sort, you have to be able to kind of run movements and uh, assess them as they're moving along. Second one is planned versus unplanned movements. 
this is kind of goes also to the controlled versus uncontrolled movement patterns. Most of these steps that are done in the clinical setting are a planned movement where the athlete has complete control of their body. They can kind of uh, move where they want, change when they want, how fast they want, or anything of that sort. Most of the movements, on the other hand, in a co true competition tend to be unplanned. Just like in football, when a football player is running down the field, especially running back, he tends to change patterns or his movement is dictated by what the opponent is doing, whether they're going to the right, whether they're going to the left, a secondary opponent, a third opponent, or something of that sort. Again, I understand this may be tough to do in a clinical setting, in a controlled environment, because unless you bring other athletes in there to be able to kind of simulate what the athlete does. But again, utilizing some kind of technology to be able to assess them as they're on the field and be able to determine their compensation patterns as they're moving during practice, during scrimmage, before they're allowed to get into true competition would be great. The second one, I'm sorry, the third one would be fatigued versus non-fatigued. Most of these assessments tend to be performed during a non-fatigue stage. Now, one of the biggest issues with that is that, as we all know, most injuries tend to occur during a fatigue stage. There's been plenty of studies done in football or basketball where most some of these injuries, soft tissue injuries, or comp compensatory pattern injuries tend to occur during the third quarter, the fourth quarter, when the athlete starts getting fatigued. So testing these athletes during a fatigue stage can also be useful. There was a study done earlier, um, I, I don't think I have it here, um, where athletes were with a, with a history of chronic ankle stability were assessed. They were first assessed during a non-fatigue stage at a resting stage. They took a bunch of athletes, both that had a chronic history of ankle instability and, non and, and athletes that had no history of uh, chronic ankle instability, and they, and they tested them at a non-fatigue stage. Then they ran them through a fatigue program where they were trying to pretty much fatigue the glute max muscle and get them as fatigued as possible, and then they retest them afterwards. Um, and what they found is that they did a lot worse as far as um, how they performed once they had been fatigued, obviously because they were at a higher risk of injury. The compensatory patterns had kind of kicked in. So here is a perfect example as I call compensation in action that we actually are, we can see how an athlete is compensated. So this is an actual athlete that went through a practice. This athlete created technology shorts and we, the, the uh, athletic trainers, physical therapists were uh, monitoring him and as you can see here, the yellow are pretty much, or actually all the numbers on the left are pretty much the muscular outputs um, when they, the muscles contract. The yellow section is identifying the hamstring. The kind of the orange, orangey, reddish area, we're looking at the um, quad, quads, and the purple one at the bottom, we're looking at the glute, glute muscles as far as muscular output. Well, in this case, as you can see in, in the uh, with the circle, the athlete sustained an injury. He basically fell, and which resulted in a contusion to the glute max muscle. <clears throat> now, the athlete was able to play, as most athletes continue with something so simple as a contusion and kind of continue processing. But as he he was moving, um, in order to be able to function, he was experiencing some discomfort. So obviously his body had to go into a compensation pattern to be able to continue performing his task. As you can see here, the glute max muscle started shutting down, meaning he started utilizing less of his glute max muscle because that's where the injury occurred. Probably some muscle spasm kind of occurred. The athlete was, didn't want to use that muscle because probably increased discomfort. So the, the glute max started decreasing. Now, on the other hand, the compensation pattern occurred where now the hamstring muscle had to kick in and do more of the explosive movements um, in this manner in order for the athlete to be able to kind of continue doing, performing his task at hand. Now, as the glute muscle decreases, the hamstring increases. So now he uses more hamstring issues or the comp compensatory pattern is occurring. So now he might be at a higher risk of either hamstring strain. There may be an imbalance between the hamstring and the quad ratio here. So he may be at a high risk for any type of other injuries. But at the end of the day, um, this is where they were able to identify, in this case, as an athletic trainer, physical therapist, watching your athlete and the compensation pattern occurring, the question is, do you go ahead and pull him in this case, try to reduce his risk of injury, or you continue monitoring him and see where he continues on? So what is EMG Strive technology? This is a quote from one of our um, sports scientists within its strive. So they're pretty much surface electromyography that measures electrical potential generated by muscle cells. 
the electrophysiological activation of a muscle initiates the mechanical force production. Down below is an image of the example of the um, Strive shorts technologies where the athletes wear. You see the EMG sensors kind of embedded into the shorts. They're very thin. Um, they're not thick at all whatsoever. Most athletes, and not all athletes, don't even know that they have the, uh, the sensors on. They're embedded into normal shorts. Most, most athletes wear these types of shorts underneath their major garments, whether you're NFL, whether you're NHL, or hockey players, whether you're basketball players. These are kind of pretty much um, some of the most the common uh, attire or equipment that the athletes wear. So strive to not be biased. They decided to take the shorts and have a university validate them. Um, they met up with Dr. Eddie Joe over at Cal Poly Pomona University located in Pomona, California. They provided them the shorts and what they wanted to do is be able to validate the technology embedded into the Strive shorts with um, and compare it to actual EMG technology and see what how well it was able to compare. So this is pretty much the setup for the study that was performed in Cal Poly. The setup consisted of active and healthy subjects who performed three squats with different weights at 30%, 60%, and 80% of max. The subjects were required to test while wearing both the Strive Sensor 3 technology and they utilized also the Delsys Trigno EMG sensors. The setup required subjects to perform while monitoring quad muscular groups with sensors overlaying the rectus femoris on both the left and the right leg. And here are the results of the studies that was performed at Cal Poly Pomona. Basically, the correlations between the Strive and the Delsys indicated repeatable and reliable readings. Strive showed average correlation between its measurements and the Delsys system across all subjects. To the right is the image and the actual results of all the subjects and the correlation numbers. So like I mentioned in the previous slide, the data showed high correlation in repeated cases between both systems. It's important to notice that while the correlation is high, 50% of the samples were removed due to poor contacts between the electrodes and the body. There was no significant difference in signal repetition amplitude measured between systems. If you have any questions or are interested into the study, you can contact Strive, and I believe the study is also on their website. So, how can you use Strive to identify lower extremity compensation patterns? As we've discussed, we've discussed the muscle imbalances, we've discussed compensation patterns, we discussed how compensation patterns is, are, is normal or common among athletes. Like I mentioned, humans, the human body is a compensation pattern machine. Um, some of the most common compensation patterns as far as, uh, as healthcare professionals, out there, trainers, physical therapists, we can quickly identify and be able to see, just as the image is down below. You see the gentleman um, or the athlete on the left-hand side, where they have the both knees in a valgus stage. Those are very common to see. You can identify it. They're very visible. Um, it's easy, qu quickly to correct and be able to, be able to see what's going on. Very similar to the image on the right-hand side. When an athlete squats, we use some of the assessments to be able to see whether their movements, make sure they have proper um, dorsiflexion or angles in their ankles. They're maintaining the proper form while they're doing their squat. So when an athlete does an improper squat um, and the signs or the movements or the deficiencies, I should say, or the compensation patterns are very obvious. It's very easy to identify as a athletic trainer, as a physical therapist, as a strength and conditioning coach. Again, here's another example where it's very commonly seen a, a, a qualified strength and conditioning coach, qualified athletic trainer, or physical therapist can quickly identify the compensatory or the improper movement patterns while this athlete's doing a simple RDL. On the left-hand side, you see him kind of curving his back, not properly hinging at the hips. On the right-hand side, a strength coach, um, athletic trainer, physical therapist can make the proper corrections, be able to view it when they do it correctly. So what do you see versus what Strive sees? Here's an example of an athlete performing an isometric quad contraction. We're going to play the video and I'm going to see if you can identify any deficiencies, any compensation patterns, or any cues that you might want to give this athlete if they're doing it properly.
Was there anything that you were able to identify with it? Was there any cues you might want to give this athlete to make any corrections? So now let's see what Strive was able to see. If we take a look at the image on the left-hand side with the athlete. We can see that there was very little, if not no, valgus stress in the movement. His feet are pointing forward, if not slightly out, proper form. He's sitting back like he's supposed to be doing during a squat. His arms are evenly spread out. But let's see what Strive was able to identify. If you look at the image on the right hand side, there's two lines, a blue line and a yellow line. The blue line identifies the muscular output that's coming from the left leg. The yellow line identifies the muscular output that's coming from the right leg. As you can see, the blue line is a lot higher than the yellow line, which identifies that this athlete was being, was being left leg dominant and was producing way more force on the left leg while performing this task. The interesting part about this is that once the athlete completed this task, I had mentioned to him that he was becoming left leg dominant, that he was favoring his left leg to the movement. His reply to me was like, no, that can't be. I felt pretty, pretty symmetrical when I did the movement. So once the athlete was done performing the task, we showed him the data and we provided feedback. So we, he decided to go ahead and perform this task again with the proper feedback and the corrections that was provided with Stripe technology. Let's see how he did. So with proper feedback, you can see a pretty much huge difference between the right leg and the left leg. Even though you can still identify that he was still continuing to be a little bit more left leg -like dominant during, um, during the activity, most of the muscular output came from the left leg. You can now see more of the muscular output coming from the right leg. There was a little bit more symmetry um, between the left and the right leg compared to the first time, even though there was still some asymmetry. But at the end of the day, we provided the feedback. We were able to identify it using the Stripe technology. The athlete was able to make some of the corrections and was able to continue performing the task, continue be able to train, and be able to train correctly. So here's one more for you. Can you see what Strive can see? Here the athlete's performing an isometric deadlift. Let's take a look. Now this was from a side view, so we weren't able to see the uh, front view, so to speak. Now unfortunately we do not have the data here with us today, but we do have the data. If you are interested and you think you're able to identify any of the deficiencies and you can kind of match what Strive was able to see, feel free to email us or contact us and we'll be happy to provide some of that information over to you and see if you were able to, if your eye was as good as Strive's eyes. So thank you for joining us today. To learn more about Strive, or if you have any questions regarding today's webinar, please contact Derek Wester at derek.wester Derek at Strive Tech, or he can be reached on his cell phone at 312-669-4784. Or you're also welcome to visit the website at strivetech.com. Like I mentioned earlier in the presentation, this today is just part one of a four part series on how EMG sensors can be utilized with your athletes and your clients during rehabilitation and also to help reach peak performance. Stay tuned for part two where we're gonna be discussing fatigue, how it affects load symmetry, ratio, and efficiency. Part three, we're gonna be discussing performance itself, how to manage load, symmetry, ratio, and efficiency. And finally, how to utilize Strive technology and EMG sensors in rehabilitation, utilizing it to be able to determine when an athlete is ready to go on to the next milestone, be able to monitor the load 
monitor any compensation patterns as you're progressing them through their milestones, symmetry, ratio, and efficiency. Again, thank you for your time. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask questions either by putting them in the chat or you're also welcome to raise your hand. Again, I want to thank Strive for hosting today's webinar and please stay tuned for part two, part three, and part four of this four part series on EMG sensors and how to utilize to mitigate injuries. Thank you. Hey everybody, so thank you for uh, attending the webinar. If you guys have any questions, please feel free to input them into the chat or you're welcome to unmute yourself and uh, ask away. Okay, so we have one. Okay, so we have a question here. When an athlete appears ready to return to play via traditional assessments, but not ready to play via dynamic testing. Uh, but not ready to play via dynamic testing, perhaps using Strive. What is the next step in your opinion or experience in training Interve or intervention in order to gain symmetry in dynamic movements. Again, assuming that the athlete appears symmetrical in the static and or assessment setting. Uh, so that's the, the, the question as far as when we do assessments and when I work with athletes or, or in the re rehabilitation phase or the return to activity phase. Um, there is movements as far as like they mentioned, as far as the static phase when the play, an athlete's in a stationary position and then, then when they're in the functional movement uh, position. Um, when the athlete has full control of their body, they're able to kind of control the movements, they're able to control some of the muscular output that they're required to, to kind of function. But when they get into what I would like to call the uncontrolled environment, out in real life, out in the field, when there's other variables involved, uh, other uh, uh, opponents, uh, something simple as uh, the ball being tossed over to you or thrown to you, that's where some of the compensation patterns kind of occur. And this is where some of the dynamic movements that we want to kind of incorporate into athletes who want to be able to teach and train them. Uh, most recently, I'm working with an athlete right now that's returning from an ankle injury. And right off the bat, one of the first assessments I did was just a simple squat and or uh, would refer to as monster walks or lateral patterns. He immediately compensated and started using more of his right leg. So my job was to try to retrain him and teach him how to reuse his left quad, his left leg as, as a basis or at least be able to get some symmetry using something as therabands um, on the waist in between the knees or also pulling and forcing him to use that. Now, in order for me to be able to see that he's forcing, that he's utilizing the left quad, I have the strap technology, I have the shorts on, so I can visually see as he's making, moving those patterns, I can see whether he's, uh, whether he's engaging the left quad or not. And if he's not, then it's my job to try to kind of, to change the movement or change the resistance or provide the feedback to him. Once I did that, he was able to do the same movement again. So we reassessed him at the end of the hour session and he did the same stationary or, or static squat. And at that time he was able to reproduce some of the contraction from the left quad. And we got, we got some symmetry. It wasn't hundred percent symmetry, but it was more than what we started with. But the fact that I had the strong technology, I was able to visually see him utilizing or engaging that quad. Or if he wasn't engaging, I would be able to provide some feedback or my job would be to try to kind of figure out a way how to get him to engage that quad, the left, the left, I'm sorry, the left glute to be able to function and reduce his risk of injury when he's returning back to play. Hopefully that answered your question. Any other questions? Oh, by the way, I'm also, um, I just, this just arrived today. So I want to kind of let everybody know I'm kind of excited to use this. This is the new battery uh, charger for the uh, Strive shorts that are going to be coming out. Um, it's really nice. It's really small. My understanding, it has a great uh, higher battery life. So I'm able to use it longer periods of time. I can use it throughout the day, interchange it between, uh, with other shorts with all my athletes. Don't have to worry about going back and have to recharging it 
or even don't have to worry about, you know, plug it into my uh, car charger as I'm driving to work with another athlete. I could just take one and keep it for the rest of the day. We might have had one more question. Take a look, take a look, take a look. Do you have any instances where you have used Strive outside of the lab and detected any abnormalities that help to prevent injury or possibly rehab faster? Uh, yes, so there was one huge case scenario that pops right in my head right now. Um, I was overseas working with uh, in an international team and the, their athletes were testing the product over there and their owner, their management allowed me to, to utilize uh, the shorts. So I went ahead and placed the shorts on their top athletes. I don't know why just that, that's just what they wanted. And they were, it was during a live game. So they were competing during a live game. And as I'm watching the, the athletes move, uh, their starting point guard started showing a little bit of abnormalities. And one of the abnormalities that I was able to identify as, they were, as he was moving is that he started compensating and favoring one leg over the other. I don't recall the exact leg that he was favoring, but I remember he was kind of, every time he pushed off, the muscular output coming from one leg was a lot higher than the other one. And as the game kind of progressed, you can see there was a, a higher gap, higher gap, higher gap in between. Um, so one of the things I did right away, I went over to the head coach. I asked him, hey, can you pull him out for a quick second can you, or call a timeout? He was happy to do that. He pulled him out. I asked the, the athlete, hey, what's going on? Are you okay? And right away, he's like, no, Marco, um, my left groin, I think it was one of his groins, I started to get a little tight as, as I'm playing. Um, so we pulled him out, asked the coach if I could pull him out. We did some um, myofascial releases. We correct, did some uh, core activation. I tried to correct that movement in the part. He went back and played. And it kept monitoring him during the, the rest of the game. There was still a little bit of an asymmetry, but it wasn't as much as it was before, but I kept monitoring. So if it ever reached any, any higher amount, then that's how I would have kind of pulled him out. Now, can I say, did I prevent from any or, or an, an injury occurring? That we don't know. But the fact that I was able to identify an abnormality, I was able to identify the asymmetry while the, while the athlete was in, in motion and playing, I was able to kind of nip it in the behind, so to speak, or at least able to address it. Um, and be able to deal with that spot versus waiting uh, waiting to the end or being more of a reactive motion. He pulled his groin, pulled a the hamstring, then I got to treat him. Now he's out for a good four to six weeks. That's four to six weeks that's been time lost from him playing. Uh, he was able to continue the rest of the game. He was able to practice the next day. We were able to treat him and he didn't lose any time due to that issue or that incident. Uh, question. Thank you, Rafael. Athletes buy-in is key to success. Have you ever had pushback or feedback from the athletes that you use this tech with? No, that's the interesting part about it. And that's the one beauty about these uh, Stripe shorts is that if you look at all professional athletes, collegiate athletes, um, they wear some kind of garment or shorts very similar to underneath their uniform. This is kind of nature. That's part of their um, uniform. That's You'll find that in their in their net bag, as, as, so to speak, as you call it. Um, so either they're going to wear something either way. So why not wear the Stripe shorts? It's the exact same thing, whether it's an Under Armour or, or Nike you can go ahead and use it. Um, one of the beauty things about the uh, the, the pot that, that they use in there, it's right in the front. Um, I've never had a player that, you know, has told me that it bothers them or they even noticed it. The funny part about it is that when an when I started using this with an athlete and I'm done with the session, I asked them for the pot back. One of their first reactions to me is like, oh wait, I forgot I even had it on. Uh, so it's very lightweight. They don't know it that's there. They don't experience it. And again, that's one of the beauty things about this. So anytime I have um, individuals or companies that in the past have come and talked to me about uh, some kind of new technology, new device, and it's kind of bulky, one of my first questions, you know, they come to me, it's like, hey, Marco, we have this new, new huge backpack, or whatever it is, they'll provide you with all the information that you need. You won't need anything else. My first reply to them is, well, if the athlete refused to wear it because it's too bulky, too big, what information, what good is it for me? And they look at me, it's like, well, it's not. So obviously comfort level is huge with the athletes. It's gotta be something that they can use. They already wear the, they will already wear tights or shorts underneath. That's already done. And this thing is so small, so great that most if not all athletes don't even know it's there. I've never had anybody kind of complain about it.
or questions. Okay, I don't think I see any more questions on the chat. So we're, I guess we're gonna go ahead and conclude the webinar. I wanna thank everybody for showing up. Um, if you guys have any questions um, beyond this, you guys are welcome to either email Derek at the, at the email that I provided there. If, uh, if you wanna take a look, go to the website at Strive Tech. Um, feel free to DM me if you guys have any, any questions that you, I may answer specifically, any case scenarios um, that you have with your athletes currently right now that you can see how you want to kind of maybe get some input as to how you can utilize uh, strive technology with their rehab, with their performance, their strength and conditioning, anything of that sort. Feel free to reach out to me. I'm happy to answer any questions even beyond this. Other than that, thank you, everybody. Again, thank you for Strive for hosting this webinar. Um, and see you guys hopefully in part two. <laughs>